Hey yo, LAZ man, I'm cooking up a crazy new album right now. You heard? I want your opinion on which designer I should use to do my cover. You heard? Cause you know I always keep a fire cover. The bars on this album, crazy. The beats on this album, crazy. If you wanna be a part of a masterpiece, Send me an email at the gem pop LLC at gmail.com. Hey, yo, LAZ, make sure you run over and subscribe to my bros over there at InSource TV. They got a lot of fire exclusive interviews. Yershk. Check their new joint with Mr. Full Moon. It's called Tales of a Killer Priest. Exclusive stories you never heard in your life. Yershk. Leave some comments, tell them Z-Man Suicide Polo with the Ski Man sent you. Links in the description and in the comment section. Make sure you check my bro Shrine B out of Jersey. You heard, follow him on that gram. And go check them bangers out at repyourset.net. You heard? Also check that album for me and Shrine B in a state heavyweight. All right, first of all, you know, I just want to continue to say thank you. You know, to everybody that's been donating to the Truth Parker Fund. You know, every contribution y'all made has been a blessing in a major, major way. You know, and I can't even really begin to show y'all how appreciative I am for all that kind of support. You know, it definitely means a lot to me. So, you know, if you haven't already or you would like to, you feel like you got a single dollar to spare, go ahead and hit up the cash app, Truth Parker Fund, all one word, no spaces. Y'all continue to bless me, and I'm going to definitely return the favor. Continue to bless you with these real-life drama stories and content that you ain't going to find nowhere else. You understand what I'm saying? Um, with that being said, though, um, it's another one of them stories, man, that's kind of heart-wrenching. You know what I mean? Another one of those stories that I ain't really too fond of talking about too much, but, you know, as I mentioned to you before, if I'm going to tell this type of story, you know, I'm going to be sure to bring it to you, lads, because I ain't going to do this shit with nobody else. You understand what I'm saying? And y'all ain't going to get this type of shit nowhere else either. That's a fact. Anyway, you know, like I said, this is another wild-ass story, man, about this dude named Ricky Gray and his nephew named Ray Dandridge. He basically went on a killing spree in Richmond back in 2006. Now, I can remember this shit vividly, you know, like it happened last week. And the reason why, you know, it stands out so clear in my mind is because it took place on January 1st, New Year's Day. You know what I'm saying? That was the first murders of that year. And they wound up killing like seven people in the span of just one week before getting caught. You know, and then all the details started unfolding and it had got discovered that, you know, they had also been linked to the killings of two other people in Pennsylvania. And then almost killing a third person in Arlington, Virginia. You know, and that was like right before they flipped out in Richmond. So all together, you know, it was like nine people that they killed and the 10th victim wound up surviving. So ultimately, you know, Ricky, he wound up being convicted of uh, multiple capital murders, got the death penalty for it. You know, and he got executed by the state in 2017. He was actually the second to last person to get executed by the state before they abolished the death penalty in 2019. You know, I think the dude, um, John Muhammad, the DC sniper guy, he was killed a couple years prior to that. And then I seem to remember um, a little female or something that got executed somewhere around that time too. I'm not sure if she was the last person to die or whether it was somebody else, but anyway, the dude Ray, who happened to be Ricky's nephew, he wound up taking a plea deal, you know, to some of the murders and he avoided the death penalty, but he got a life sentence without the possibility of parole. And he's actually still in prison to this day, out here in a spot called Sussex. You know, he ain't gonna never see the streets again. But what's so wild about his case specifically, and what makes it so hard, you know, and difficult for me to comprehend about the role that he played in all of it, is the fact that he had just come home from doing a 10 year bid on some armed robbery shit, like two, like two months prior to him and uh, his uncle Ricky wilding out. So, you know, just so y'all understand, they was both blood related, okay, uncle and nephew, but they was the same age. You know, they was both 28. They 
birthdays really just so happened to be a couple of days apart. You know, you know, they were basically the same age as me at that time. So, however that happened, you know, Ricky was dude's uncle. And then through the course of the trials, you know, Ray's defense lawyers, he tried to paint the picture of him being like borderline mentally challenged or handicapped or some shit like that. And he tried to make Ricky out to basically be the leader and the mastermind of all the shit that they did together. You know, as if he was trying to make his nephew commit these crimes with him. Um, so I guess basically trying to minimize dude's role in what they did, you know, as if he shouldn't be held responsible for his actions. That's basically how he wound up getting the life sentence and Ricky wound up getting the death penalty. So, I mean, I guess it worked out in his favor or on his behalf, so to speak. Truth is, though, you know, dude always been a maniac, for real. You know what I mean? He always been a real devious, cut dope type of nigga that would probably follow along with anything, you know, that sounded or looked like a good plan, no matter how crazy this shit was. Especially when he was on the PCP. You know, when they was both on that shit heavy. I said that to say, you know, he ain't really do too much thinking for himself. You understand what I'm saying? So... I guess in the long run, you know, I'm not really surprised that he wound up playing the part he did and all of what happened. Now, it's a lot to this story, all right? So I'm gonna try and lay it all out the best way I can for you. So if I happen to mention anything, you know, that sounds a little confusing or whatever, um, just let me know, you know, and I'll try to clarify whatever point it is that I'm trying to convey to you. But the joint was real high profile and heinous, you know, and sad. It's really a fucked up situation for real. You know, but this is how it all went down. So, 2005, you know, the dude, Ricky Gray, he had not too long just come home from doing a prison bid, you know, probably about a year or so. And shortly after that, he wound up marrying his little girlfriend and moving into her place, which happened to be a home that was owned by her family out in uh, Washington, Pennsylvania. Now, for anybody that's curious, that's just a little suburb right outside of Pittsburgh. You know, and they was living together for a few months out there. They supposedly had a real toxic relationship with one another. You know, always arguing, fighting, and fussing, shit like that. You know, it was definitely a lot of physical altercations between them. And they was both on all types of drugs, too. So, you know, I guess you could probably imagine the type of shit that they'd be fighting about. Um, Shorty's parents, you know, they would actually go on record after the fact to say that it was a real abusive relationship between the two of them for the whole time that they was together. Now, the dude, Ray, Dandridge, who, like I mentioned, was Ricky's nephew, he got released from prison in the end of October that same year, 2005. And uh, Ricky, he wound up inviting him to come stay with him and his wife out in Pennsylvania until he could get on his feet. You know, I suppose he ain't really had nowhere else to go at that time. So I guess you could imagine, you know, shorty girl, Ricky's wife, she wasn't too happy about the situation at all. And it caused even more conflict and friction between her and Ricky. You know, and it's just my assumption that Ray, he probably became a little frustrated, you know, and resentful himself towards her, you know, because of the hard times he was giving his uncle about him even being there. So roughly about a week later, you know, after his release, Shorty Girl's dead body is found, beaten to a bloody pulp. She's laying in a shallow grave on the side of the road, somewhere near where they live in Pennsylvania. And what's crazy about that is, you know, both Ricky and Ray, got picked up, interviewed, and questioned by the police about it. But they wasn't labeled as any suspects at that time, so they wasn't charged with nothing. And Shorty's, uh, Shorty's death wound up just getting ruled as a drug overdose. Um, and it won't be till like weeks later, uh, when all these other murders come to light, that the police finally get a confession and find out what happened to his wife. But I'm gonna get to that in a second though. So here it is, you know, about a year or so from him getting released, six months after being married, one week after his nephew comes home from prison, his wife turns up dead. So the following week after that, shorty girl parents, she, they are victim both from the property. You know, so Ray, he winds up moving to West Philly with his father, and Ricky, he winds up moving in with his grandmother somewhere in Arlington, Virginia. And then on Christmas Day, uh, Ray, he winds up traveling down from Philly to meet up with his uncle in VA. And from there, all hell would break loose. So, apparently, they wind up catching some random guy in front of his house and attacking him. 
know, and it's not clear whether or not this was an attempted robbery or what was really going on there, but the dude is beaten up real bad. You know what I mean? He's stabbed multiple times in the neck, in the chest, in the arms, and he actually wound up spending the next two weeks in a coma, which after coming out of the coma, he had permanently lost the use of one of his arms. But he was lucky to be alive, though. You know, that won't be the case for these next victims in this crazy-ass war path for these things. Now, it's also a fact, too, that these guys was both getting high off of PCP and some other stuff for like three or four days straight. You know, and I'd like to assume that they was really probably on a mission to stay high and get even higher. You know what I mean? And was trying to find some money to make that happen because even though, you know, it's absolutely no justifying the shit that they did next. I mean, somehow, some way, I just don't want to believe these dudes' hearts is just that cold and ruthless. You know, and that they intentionally and purposefully carried out the shit that they did in the same, in the same mind frame. You know what I mean? You gotta be like a real sick individual to do the type of shit they did. So as it turns out, you know, they wind up traveling to Richmond, you know. That's where they meet up with this girl named Ashley, you know, who just so happened to be a girlfriend of Ray's. Now it's really not clear, you know, how well Ray knew the girl, because remember, it's only been two months since he came home from doing 10 years. And she also winds up getting killed later on. So how they met, you know, is gonna forever remain a mystery. Anyhow, you know, however they knew each other, Shorty was down with the lick, you know, and apparently she had already had some houses picked out that she thought was gonna be some good spots for them to rob and find some valuable merchandise to steal. And I guess, you know, turn around and sell it or whatever. Now maybe she knew already, maybe she didn't, but the first house that she picked out happened to belong to this pretty well-known affluent white family who the husband happened to be the lead singer and guitarist for this popular local rock band called the house of freaks and whose wife she happened to be the sister of a well-known hollywood actor now, i ain't gonna reveal his name or nothing but she was also the co-owner of a real popular toy store in richmond's Carytown shopping district area now for those that's not familiar you know Carytown is like the white folks downtown area you know, it's a long ass strip full of clothing and antique stores, little shops of all kinds, little restaurants, bars, all kind of shit really. You know, and it stays packed with customers all day and night, especially during this time, you know, which would have been the holiday season. And even though, you know, everybody travels down there at some point or another, it's really considered to be like prime real estate for retail stores. You know, and I know that personally because I tried to open a couple businesses out there before and the rents for the buildings and the storefronts was just astronomical and through the roof. So I never wound up doing it, you know, but I know the area well, everybody does. So anyway, it's mid afternoon, all right, January 1st. Ashley takes the niggas Ricky and Ray to this house that she's been scoping out and she's told to wait outside in the car while they make their way inside. Now this is where it gets real crazy and all hell break loose. So however they wind up getting in the house undetected, they come to realize that the whole family was still there, you know, and they wind up coming face to face. So, you know, they quickly overpower everybody in there, the mom, the dad, and a little four-year-old girl. And there's actually another little nine-year-old girl, but she's off at a friend's house at the moment, and hadn't really returned home yet. So Ricky winds up taking the family down to the basement and tying them all up with electrical cords and duct tape while Ray is upstairs ransacking the house, trying to collect whatever he could get his hands on that seems valuable. So in the midst of all of this, you know, the little nine-year-old, she's returning home now and being brought back to the house by her friend's mother, who happens to walk her up to the front door. Now realizing this, Ricky unties the mother and walks her back upstairs to allow her to retrieve her daughter. Now he must have warned her, you know, and persuaded her not to be acting all suspicious and shit as to give off any warning signals, you know, as to what was actually taking place inside the house. Um, because, I mean, it's obvious that the other parent, she didn't notice anything alarming. You know, no red flags or nothing like that. She did wind up saying after the fact that she noticed the lady did seem kind of pale, but she wasn't really alarmed as to anything being wrong. So she just turned around and left, you know, and then Ricky took the mom and the nine-year-old back down to the basement and tied them both back up. And this time, he put plastic bags over everybody's head and he bound it with duct tape, you know, as if he was trying to suffocate them all. 
I guess that ain't really work out the way that he thought it would. So he just starts smashing them all in their heads with a claw hammer numerous times and then stabbing them in their backs and chest and slitting their throats with this big ass kitchen knife and watching over them as they all squirmed on the floor gasping for air trying to take their last breaths. So picture this nigga, you know, he, he's standing there hovering right on top of him, listening to them little babies crying and dying. You know, the knife he used was so big, man, that when the little four-year-old got stabbed in the back, the blade wound up puncturing her lungs. He came straight through her chest. Real sick-ass nigga, man, by any standards. So, anyway, by this time, you know, I guess Ray had found any and everything in the house that he considered to be of value, and he wound up joining Ricky in the basement. And then it's at that moment that they decided they was going to burn and torch the house, you know, and try to destroy as much as they could of the crime scene and any other evidence of them even being there. So they wound up gathering up a few bottles of wine that they found, and they, they knocked over this little art easel or whatever with all kind of paints and other little flammable things on it. And they started pouring the wine all out over everything and setting a fire before walking out the house and back to the car where Ashley was still outside waiting on them. Now, unfortunately for them, though, before the house could go completely up in flames, it was a neighbor who also happened to be the drummer in that same house of freaks band. He noticed the smoke and the flames coming from his partner's house, and he called 911. So when the fire department and the authorities came out to stop the blaze, that's when they noticed the gruesome discovery and found the murdered family in their own basement. You know what I mean? That shit was terrible as hell, but this story is far from over. You know, that's just the beginning of it all. So now it's January 3rd, two days later. Um, they come up on another house out on Hollywood Drive in Chesterfield that Ashley must have scoped out as well. Now, if you don't know, Chesterfield is like another one of the surrounding bordering counties of Richmond. You know, and it's a lot of big homes and stuff like that out there. So it was an older couple that was living out there. And the trio, Ricky, Ray, and Ashley, they wind up gaining entry to that house by, I don't know, somehow pretending to be looking for directions or whatever. And um, they beat the old man over the head with something solid. You know, I'm not quite sure what it was. And then they pinned the old lady down to the floor so that she couldn't move. And then they started taking items. You know, I think they got like $800 in cash a laptop, a television, some jewelry, you know, and a few other things before the old man was able to persuade him to not tie him up and hurt him any further because his wife was already disabled. And she needed him to even help her get around. So that couple got lucky, you know what I mean? The group left them and didn't cause them any more harm. You know, now this is where it gets even more interesting though. So by now, you know, it's been a few days. Ricky and Ray, they hanging out with the chick Ashley. You know, they get high and all of that, doing whatever it is they do. And they trying to sell off some of the stuff that they've been stealing. And you know, acting as if everything is normal or whatever. And apparently Ashley, you know, she's been introducing them to people that she know as her boyfriends. Now, I don't think at this point, Ricky or Ray thought that was a good idea. You know, and they probably was getting a little paranoid with all the talk that was going around about the well-known family being killed in their basement. And I'm not even sure, because uh, it, it was never made clear if at this point the chick Ashley was even aware of them killing those people while she was waiting outside. I mean, it's just hard to say at this point. But apparently, Rick and Ray, they must have started thinking that she was getting too many, she was letting too many people know, you know, that they had been involved with robbing several houses in that area. So on January 6th, the police wound up getting the call from what they would describe as a concerned Chesterfield resident, you know, who happened to be the parent of one of Ashley's friends, who stated that she had became concerned and suspicious for whatever reasons about Ashley's safety and her hanging with these older guys that she brought to her house and was introducing them as her boyfriend and trying to sell stolen merchandise. She wound up stating to the police that she thought that they might have had something to do with the murders of that family. So, the detectives, they wound up making a trip to the lady's house, you know what I'm saying? And she showed them a couple of the items that she bought from Ashley and the men. And lo and behold, they was identified as belonging to that murdered family. So, you know, immediately the, the detectives, they get a squad together, you know, and they try to go raid this residence on East Broad Rock Road, 
that's where Ashley lived with her parents at the time. Now what's crazy is when they get there, you know, and proceed to knock the doors down to make entry to the house, they discover that the house already been ransacked and it was three more dead bodies in there. One of 21 year old Ashley, one of her mother and her stepdad, all gagged and bound tied up with plastic bags sealed over their heads with layers and layers of duct tape around their faces and their throats cut wide open. All three of them had been suffocated, you know, due to the amount of tape that was wrapped around them. And it was a bloody mess, man. Talking about some wild ass shit out of a horror movie. So, as it turns out, you know, the very next morning, both Ricky and Ray, they get arrested back in West Philly at Ray's father's house. Now, I'm not too clear on all the details, you know, how they got found so fast. But what I do know is that not long into the police interrogation, you know, Ray wound up confessing to killing Ashley and her family. And Ricky, he wound up giving a three-page detailed account of how he slaughtered the other family in their basement with the big kitchen knife and claw hammer and then setting the house on fire. You know, he also wound up confessing to beating his wife to death while Ray held her down. And then he also confessed to that wild ass attack on the dude that they beat into a coma but wind up surviving. So, ultimately, you know, Ricky got charged with five counts of capital murder. You know, and Ray was charged with three. And they wind up both acknowledging that, you know, Ashley participated in the first family's murders where she played the role of a lookout and stayed in the car. And that she also played the role in, uh, in the Chesterfield robbery of the older couple too. But, you know, what's even crazier about all this shit is, come to find out, it was actually Ashley's idea to rob her own parents' house. You know, according to both Ricky and Ray, both their testimonies and confession accounts, supposedly part of the plan was for her to play the victim and be willingly tied up and gagged alongside her mom and her stepdad, you know, so it wouldn't seem as though she set the whole thing up and had something to do with it. You know, I guess Ricky and Ray, they just wound up going a little too far. And the original plan just went left. And um, um, either that, you know, they just uh, got tired of, you know, playing the killer all along. But um, however it went down, you know, whatever went wrong, Ashley, who at one point, you know, was a willing participant in all the madness, was now a murder victim herself at the very same hands of the same guys that she was helping and happened to call her boyfriend. And um, they wound up leaving the scene in her parents' car. You know, and Ashley was found still wearing the wedding bands of the husband and wife who got slaughtered first when they found her body in the house next to her parents. So as it turns out, you know, when the trial started, initially both Ricky and Ray pled not guilty, you know, and tried to put up defenses. Ricky's being that his usage of PCP and other drugs kind of paired with his troubled childhood which was filled with physical and sexual abuse or whatever was the cause of his actions. And Ray's defense, like I said earlier, was that he was somewhat mentally challenged or impaired, you know, and uh, was under his uncle's power and felt he needed to do what he was told and go along with all the plans or wind up being a victim himself. You know, but neither one of those defenses worked though. And get this, you know, it ain't even stopped there. Because by the end of that same year, you know, Ricky would also get charged with the murder of another female companion of his that was in Culpeper County, Pennsylvania. You know, this was like right before his wife's murder. She happened to be a 37-year-old mother of three that was found shot and hanged by an electrical cord in her own basement that also happened to be set on fire. You know, this nigga was ruthless, man. So they both wound up being tried separately. You know, Ray, he wound up taking a plea deal at the very last moment and getting sentenced to life without parole, being sent off to a maximum security state prison, you know, never to be heard from again. As for Ricky Gray, well, after four days of trial and three hours of deliberations, the jury would find him guilty on all counts, you know, and sentencing him to death. And he wound up spending the rest of his years on death row. And then after all his appeals and motions and clemency attempts, you know, made his way through the courts and all that, and he was finally denied by the governor, he wound up being executed by lethal injection in January of 2017. 
which happened to be almost 11 years to the day of him committing the actual crimes. So, look, I mean, I'm sure you could probably tell by the story I just told that these two niggas, Ricky and Ray, was on some other shit. You know what I mean? A whole nother level of crazy and criminality. Way beyond the average and above average levels of normal violence, for real. You know, I guess you just got some people in this world that are clearly just pure freaking evil, you know, for whatever reasons. You understand what I'm saying? I know, like, heavy drug use and abuse, you know, can always play a big part, you know, in people's decision-making processes, but I, I, I'll never relate to that, because I ain't never did drugs of any kind, you know, other than smoke some weed or whatever. So I wouldn't really know anything about anything else. What I can tell you, though, is, and anybody else who has done it can tell you, too, that it takes a certain state of being and mindset to really intentionally take somebody's life. You know, and I'm not saying all, but in a lot of cases, you know, they wind up really just being casualties of war, the circumstance. Sad but true, you know, and I get that totally. I can relate in a big way. But, you know, to intentionally snatch the lives of innocent children, that's just like a level of madness that I ain't gonna never understand or fully comprehend. You know, and I don't feel no kind of remorse or sorrow for nobody that engages in that type of violence towards kids. You know, I feel like you deserve whatever's coming to you, point blank. And that really goes for anybody that messes with kids. You know, I'm talking about child abusers, child molesters, kidnappers, sex traffickers, and whoever else falls in that category. You know, I feel like you should all get hung upside down by your balls and tortured slow and relentlessly for weeks on end. You know, I hope y'all niggas die a real slow, painful death. And that's coming from the heart, man, real talk. Aside from that, though, I do want to make one more point. You know, and I hate to play the race cards and all that, but sometimes it's just clear as day that the disparity between us blacks and people of color compared to our white counterparts is still the same as it ever was in all facets of life, especially when we're talking about the justice system and the way we receive and acknowledge whenever tragedy strikes. And I ain't hating on nobody by any means. You know, I'm just acknowledging facts and bringing them to the light just in case these things tend to go over your head. I say that because, you know, the last story I told about Christopher Pop Goins, you know, detailed how a poor black family, you know, parents on drugs, living in the crime-filled projects, kids and all, you know, was totally annihilated in the worst fashion in one of the most heinous crimes in Richmond's history. You know, and this story right here, it also speaks on a black and a white family, you know, who was also executed in the most horrible way. And all of it's sad as hell, you know, and heartbreaking, especially because it involves small and young children. And personally, you know, I just can't rate one over the other. My point is, though, I guess because this was an, an affluent, wealthy white family and had ties to famous people in Hollywood, you know, and was well known in the community, that they deserve some type of extra special kind of recognition and dedication. I say that because in 2007, you know, which was the following year, the Richmond newspaper named that family Richmonders of the Year. You know, and then they've had annual events and fundraisers and scholarships given out and named after them too. The city of Richmond also actually just dedicated a newly built footbridge in Forest Hill Park in honor of that family and actually named it their family name. You know, there's been songs written and performed by local bands dedicated to them. There've even been gardens and flower beds planted out and around the city in the honor of those kids. You know, and different kinds of school programs was established at the schools that they attended in their memories. You know, what I'm getting at is they remembered, you know, and they talked about and written about year after year. So nobody will ever forget their legacies and all that kind of stuff. Whereas nobody ever mentions or talks about the black families, you know, that lost just as much. And if I didn't do these type of stories, and if Laz ain't had this type of platform to allow him to be heard, you know, it's a good chance that a lot of folks wouldn't even know nothing about these cases, for real. And I'll only be speaking on events that take place in Virginia and Jersey, you know, but this type of shit happens everywhere, though. You know, like I said, the level of blatant disparity and disregard to me is sometimes just hard to swallow, you know, especially when it's just so blatantly put in our faces like that. The message just becomes real clear. You know, when it comes across it to say they don't care about us, like we don't even matter, like our lives are worthless, 
You know what I mean? And that's always evident, though. So, you know, I'm going to always recognize that. And I'm going to speak on it every chance I get, especially when I got some listening ears that's going to take heed. You feel me? And um, that's all I'm going to say about that right now. You know, all in all, I ain't got no moral to this story. You know, I just want y'all to think about what I just said and know that we got to honor our own, keep our loved ones and lost ones in the forefront of our memories and hold them high with love and respect. You know, because ain't nobody else going to do that shit for us. Anyway, man, make sure to check out my podcast, man, Truth Beyond These Walls. It's on all major music streaming platforms. Drop me a note on the gram at Truth Beyond These Walls, too. I love hearing from y'all. And if you haven't yet, you know, don't forget to donate a dollar if you can spare it on Cash App to Truth Parker Fund. All one word, no spaces. Yo, shout out to you, Raz, man. You already know how we do, bro. This your man, Truth Parker. Jersey to VA all day. Holla at your boy, man. One. This call will be recorded and subject to monitoring.